As a painter and as a Frenchman, the artist Eugene Delacroix gives us a quintessential French painting, a painting of a revolution. It was created as a response to Second French Revolution of July 1830, which eventually overthrew King Charles X and replaced him with Louis-Philippe, the new king. Let me set the stage for you. It's 1830. You are in the streets of Paris. A mob of young and old revolutionaries are heading your way, tromping over barricades and bodies of dead guards. Guards are laying dead, half stripped of their clothes. Revolutions, after all, is a messy business. But there is hope. Hope comes as a symbol, a figure of a classical goddess known as Marianne, depicted as a barefooted and barebreasted woman, leading the people. She is the personification of the idea of liberty itself, hence the title of the painting, Liberty Leading the People. In one hand, she is carrying a flag of the French Revolution, the tricolor, and musket with a bayonet in the other. Right next to her is a young boy wielding two pistols. He represents the young generation. While on the other side, we see a number of characters representing mixture of classes and occupations all joining the revolution. It's like a storm coming your way. Feel the energy of the scene, a tidal wave of people, an unstoppable force, the charge led by a classical goddess, no less. So let us break down this painting and see what we can learn from it, shall we? For the grand subject like this, drama is needed. An artist tried to accomplish this in several ways. First thing you notice when you see it in person at the Louvre Museum in Paris is how large is the canvas. It's 2.6 meters by 3.25 meters. He had used three wooden panels stitched together to accommodate for the size of the painting. Figures are almost life-size. But because of the high-energy, expressionistic brushwork and action captured with gestures of figures as well as the size of the picture, you feel almost as if the figures in the painting are about to jump out of the frame and into our own space. Pretty dramatic, if you ask me. Then there is also the theatrical lighting that is enhancing the drama. After all, this painting is as much a socio-political statement as it is theater for our own entertainment. The painting is given depth with the use of light, coming from the top left side at about 45 degree angle. It's a theatrical lighting, not a naturalistic one. Real is good, interesting is better. A picture is useless when you don't know how to bring it to life. The object of art is not to reproduce reality, but to create a reality of the same or greater intensity on your own terms. We are watching theater dramatize reality. There is even a classical goddess. Liberty is her name, and she is leading the charge. She represents a powerful idea of liberty in the Republic. Worthy of revolution, and for conservative monarchs, it's a controversial idea. And so we see this controversial idea personified as a bare-breasted pagan goddess. And being the focal point, she is lit as if this was a stage play. The artist knows we humans react to bright spots, and so besides the paint, he also paints with light. He gives us a focal point to notice first. I find a single focus in the scene and then I play everything off of that one thing. So what do we notice first? Her yellow dress that stands out and of course her exposed breasts, all brightly lit. Then the eye travels upwards, noticing the profile of her face, and then her extended arm holding the flag of the French Republic. Liberty equality, fraternity. Her face in profile gives us a clue of who she might be. 
It is that familiar profile we see in depiction of Greek figures in art. The amount of action and the number of figures in the painting is pretty intense, but the artist used various compositional elements and rules of composition to make order out of chaos without losing drama and energy in the painting. The composition is divided with three foreground figures of the dead soldiers. Middle ground has six main figures. There is at least four or five more figures in the background and even more figures implied behind them. And then finally we see Notre Dame Cathedral and bits of Paris behind the smoke. This grouping of figures is in such a careful way is a favor the artist is doing for us. It's there to help us read this complex scene. If they were all mixed in one giant pile of figures, with no rhyme or logic, we the audience would feel overwhelmed and not moved by it. It is always important to imagine the point of view of your audience and how they will read your pictures. You need to communicate your ideas to the audience in the way that is more rewarding for them. But the painting is full of little easter eggs as well. As they say, obvious in art is often a sin. Art is partly communication and the rest is delicate discovery. A painting requires a little mystery, some vagueness and some fantasy. When you always make your meaning perfectly clear, you end up boring people. Another clever thing that artists used is smoke. By adding smoke to the scene, he's solving several problems. First of all, the smoke adds a sense of atmosphere. Atmosphere of heated conflict like the smoke clearing on the morning breeze on the battlefield after all the cannons and rifles have been discharged. It's also there to cover up anything in the background that is not important to the story. Any object that is not useful in expressing your idea is by definition harmful and therefore should be omitted, hidden or removed. Any buildings that might appear behind the Lady Liberty and the boy would be a distraction, so the smoke takes care of that, while managing to reveal only the parts of the building that adds not only sense of depth to the whole scene by showing us something in the distance, but it also reveals buildings that people would recognize. Like the Notre Dame Cathedral. It means we are in Paris and not just any city. And if we pay close attention, we see a group of soldiers in the distance advancing in the opposite way. It represents the uncertainty of the outcome of the revolution. More soldiers, revolutionaries will have to face at some point. The smoke also acts as a convenient compositional device to help create control over the light in the scene. It is as if the shafts of light are shining through the smoke and the smoke is breaking the light into rays, conveniently allowing them to shine just where they are needed. See how we have central figure, the goddess, the figure beneath her feet, and the dead soldiers, all conveniently cast into the light, while the area and figures around them are less brightly lit. This is theater after all. But also notice how smoke behind the central figures is also cast into the light as well as the buildings in the background. This is the way the artist creates combination of light and shade to separate the figures and define their outlines. Notice how much contrast there is between the boy and the smoke-filled backdrop. If the backdrop was not brighter than the boy, his outline would simply be lost in the backdrop and he would lose his presence in the scene. Always try to contrast dark against light and light against dark. Study Rembrandt. Unless you want to go maximum drama, like Caravaggio, he was using lighting not only to define the figures themselves, but to also define the tone of the scene adding heightened sense of drama, technique known as chiaroscuro, Italian for light and dark. Not lacking in drama of his own, Delacroix makes up for it in his painting with use of powerful gestures. Just look at them. 
The boy holding the guns, classical goddess, looking at the people she is leading, encouraging the figures just behind her, while the outstretched arm holding the flag is there to single to those at the back. It's a gesture of victory, of confidence. She is also stepping over the famous barricades as the revolution advances forward mercilessly. The rest of the figures are all in slightly different poses, offering variety, but they are all dynamic poses, with unmistakable sense of energy about them. There is also a more classical triangular composition inside the larger scene. The Lady Liberty and the boy on her left, along with the young person beneath her feet, make up a shape of a triangle. Her standing on the barricades help to establish the order of importance, a bit like Olympians standing on the podium. Gold medal, silver, and finally bronze medal, signaling their importance to the story. The makeshift barricades made up from any object found around, from stones dug up from the road to wooden planks, anything that was around. But these makeshift barricades are not the kind of barricades that would create any real protection. They are there mostly as a symbol of revolution, and also as a place on which the main figure can stand on, a stage for her, so she can be seen fully and not being obstructed while competing for space with the dead soldiers beneath her feet. After all, she is a goddess and main subject of the painting, so she must be a bit larger while also appearing as one of the Parisian women who could be part of the revolutionary movement. The barricades are an another symbol of revolutions in Paris, and they are an important symbol, so much so, the artist actually signed and dated the work on it. Since this is a painting of revolution, after all, the artist managed to take lower classes in society and elevates their importance by placing them inside the frame of high art. These characters are sketches of the new society. Children are placed right next to Marianne. It's an important point the artist makes. By choosing to place the young boy right next to the goddess, separating him from the rest, he is saying that the youth is the new hope. The future of this revolution. Love and independence, too much or too little of either and no child prospers. In times of either great struggle or great luxury, threat of revolution is just around the corner. Children and young people become deeply affected by the events around them, but they don't yet have the life experience or maturity to worry about the consequences. They have extra energy and they think they will live forever, and so they take big risks. They are never the masterminds that benefit from the revolutions. They are foot soldiers of revolutionary movements. Someone else benefits. Nonetheless, they are most likely to do risky things, taking the kind of risk that their parents and grandparents would think ten times before they do it. This painter knows this, and that is why he chooses to place the young boy by the side of goddess, fearless and full of energy. He knows the young ones are the ones that are prepared to take biggest risks, and if they succeed, they will inherit the consequences of the revolution. There is even another young boy, almost left behind in the chaos, trying to climb back to his feet, while looking up at the Lady Liberty for guidance. Young and poor, we can see a hint of what class of society he belongs to by so then back pocket on his trousers. Middle and upper class would not do that. Delacroix managed to sum up the idea of revolution and distill it down to something that is now a powerful symbol for French Republic. It's one of the most reproduced and parodied paintings on this subject. It is very much a French thing, isn't it? The revolution. They protest so often one would think it's their favorite pastime. Revolution, a forcible overthrow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. We the people, we can do better. It's a seductive idea, especially for younger population. Probably the reason why Delacroix painting is so widely reproduced. It manages to capture that romantic side of revolution as an idea. But the artist is also warning us 
about the price that might be paid in blood and the indignities that follow the chaotic rise of revolutions, the lawlessness of it all and the chaos. There is death in the picture. These are not dead heroes. There are people performing their duty of keeping law and order now dead and disgraced, dead meat, as it were. Price that must be paid. It's meant to shock us. It's meant to give us pause before we are caught up in the wild frenzy of revolutionary fever and abandon morality only an individual can uphold. The masses on the streets cannot control their own violent impulses. The dead soldiers are the members of the king's elite guard, killed by the advancing revolution. It's one of the tragedies of civil war. It's the war between the countrymen your extended community, and you might end up killing your next-door neighbor because he happened to be on the other side of the political spectrum. In the painting, the guards have died not because they did something to the revolutionaries in the picture, but they died because they wore different uniform. There is also a bit of irony to it, because there is even evidence of looting. You might have noticed that soldiers are partly stripped of their clothes and possessions. Artist is saying, look what we have done, we have stripped him of his dignity. It's another reminder and cautionary tale about revolutions. We must not lose our civilization on the way to preserving it, or we will lose something our ancestors fought and died for. The artist is giving us small easter eggs we might not even notice at first, but they give important context to the scene. Some of his characters are wearing bits and pieces of the uniforms that they have stolen of the dead soldiers. The pants of the dead guard have disappeared. Someone has stolen them. The revolutionaries are stealing from the guards as they are advancing. The boy's ammunition pouch has been stolen from the member of the royal guard. Another boy on the far left wears a police hat stolen from national guard. The man next to him, with Sabre, wears a hat taken from an elite infantry regiment. Sabre was probably stolen as well. What the artist is doing is not making the revolutionaries all good people by default. Instead, he acknowledges that many are simply opportunistic, taking advantage of the chaos. As it often happens, riots are ripe with looting. The artist is remarking upon the contradictory nature of revolutions. Ideals smeared and dirtied by harsh nature of realities. Revolutions are romantic and clean in, in the mind, but utterly dirty in reality. There is both sense of hope and excitement in the painting, and the brutal sense of delusionment when romantic ideas meet reality head on. The artist is also reminding us that our brothers and sisters have died in the revolution. He's also asking a question. A question only a person can answer for themselves after seeing the painting. Is it really worth it? He is prompting an interaction from the audience. He is opening a dialogue. In the background, there is another little Easter egg, a tiny flag on top of Notre Dame Cathedral. The same flag on large scale dominates the picture. Red, white, and blue are singing out of the painting. Even the smoke appears to be red, white, and blue. The outfit of the figure beneath the feet of the liberty is also red, white, and blue. The character appears to be a young person who is possibly knocked down in the middle of all the action and he is trying to regain his footing while looking up at the goddess for the sense of hope. By wearing flag colors, it's almost as if the message is that of uncertainty. Will the revolution even succeed? It's literally a figure wearing a flag, symbolically speaking, representing the revolution itself, as if some aspect of revolution is struggling to get back up on their feet, looking for strength to continue. I suppose this, that is why the dual characters of young generation on each side of the Lady Liberty, they will, after all, inherit the consequences of revolution, whichever they might be. A fearless young boy on the left side of the Lady Liberty, and young poor boy at her feet, struggling to get up, looking for hope. 
The tricolor was the flag of the original French Revolution, about 40 years earlier, you know, the one where they guillotined their monarchs. And the same flag was used during Napoleon times. After Napoleon's defeat, the new monarchs established his own flag. But here it is again in the painting about revolution, charged with emotion, uniting those who are thirsty for social change and for political power. Radical Republicans, as well as those nostalgic for the glories of the Napoleon's empire, and also middle-upper-class opportunists looking to profit from the revolution. They ultimately were the ones that benefited the most by having the new king they favored replace the old king they didn't. The first French Revolution began in 1789 with high hopes of for reconstructing the state but descended into reign of terror. When the violence finally burned itself out, a dictator such as the world has never seen before took power, Napoleon Bonaparte, who turned what has been the French Republic into French Empire, and then set out to conquer Europe. How had a movement for liberation from the previous regime gone so wrong, producing a trajectory that led to a despotism bloodier than the one that had come before it, after this one, all the communist revolutions have pointed to a pattern that we now know, but artists and revolutionaries didn't. Violent revolt leads to anarchy, and from conditions created by anarchy, usually a tyrant emerges, establishing a tyrannical rule much worse than the one before it. Unfortunately for France, the July Revolution of 1830 we see in the painting took down Charles X and brought Louis Philippe to the throne of France. He based his rule on the support for the upper classes, but he ultimately fell from the power because he could not win the allegiance of the new industrial classes and the poor. After 18 years on the throne, he too would be overthrown in 1848 after the economy suffered once again. Ultimately, the painting captures mass euphoria seen in revolutionary social movements. That exhilarating feeling, like you can seize the course of history and change it. An enduring feeling among younger population across the world these days. This enduring idea of revolution is probably the reason for the picture to remain so popular for so long. As if no one reads history books anymore. And so we have seen rise of riots and protests hoping for revolutions all across the world in recent times, uh, or at least before the global pandemic. Speaking of pandemic, I hope you're staying safe and learning new things from home. You might ask, why the bare-breasted woman in a street fight? Good question. Ever since the times of classical Greece, it was common idea that you can personify a virtue as a figure of a person, often as a woman. The idea of justice, for example. The Statue of Liberty was, after all, French gift to the Americans. But of course, French were always a bit more liberal with their nudity. And in our example, she is meant to be controversial. After all, revolution by its very nature is anything but conservative. She's always controversial. That is the nature. Delacroix was 32 years old when he painted the painting and he was caught up in the midst of revolution himself as a spectator. After all, it's all in the timing. He painted it in just about three months. Like journalist in a hurry to write the headline article that will be published in the morning papers. The picture, which does not represent an intense interest, cannot expect to create an intense interest. A lot of that energy that artist must have felt witnessing the development of revolution himself is captured on canvas. Painting was painted with energetic brushstrokes, matching that which he did depicts, energy released. The flag and the gesture of the goddess leading the people is the idea of French Republic up in arms, fighting the tyrant king, celebrating revolutionary masses, while offering insights into the contradictory nature of revolution itself. Not just social revolution, but it was also artistic one as well. Jacques-Louis David, 
was perhaps the most influential and famous French painter of the neoclassical era in French art, an artist that marked first French Revolution and rise and fall of Napoleon. Neoclassical brushwork is so fine and invisible that you almost paint out your personality from the brushwork, because you can't notice the hand of the human being that did the painting. It's so perfect. But with Delacroix's work and with Le Le Liberty Leading the People in particular, you can see the brushwork, you can feel the energy with which Delacroix painted. The imperfection in the brushwork is perfect for the style and this painting in particular. Revolutions are messy, why should the brushwork be any different? The most seductive thing about art is the personality of the artist himself. In contrast to neoclassical perfectionism, Delacroix took his inspiration from various artists, including Venetian Renaissance painters like Titian, and also Flemish painter Peter Paul Rubens, but also he, his own contemporaries like Theodore Jericho, one of the pioneers of Romantic movement. And Delacroix, being a friend, has even found himself being used as a model in Jericho's most famous work. The Raft of the Medusa. The painting depicts the aftermath of the wreck of the French naval frigate called Medusa, which hit a reef of the coast of Africa and sunk. At least 147 people quickly constructed raft and were set adrift. In the next 13 days before their rescue, everybody died except about 15 of them, and those that who survived endured starvation and dehydration and even cannibalism. The event became an international scandal, and partly because of the incompetence of the French captain. Jericho used friends and models for his masterpiece, and Delacroix is probably this sailor. Jericho died young, age 32, but his work influenced Delacroix. As part of the Romantic period, he emphasized color and movement rather than clarity of outline and carefully modeled form found in previous movement of neoclassicism. In his work Liberty Leading the People, he characterizes the style which is both dramatic and romantic. Romantic era as a movement emphasized emotion and individualism and glorification of the past, often celebrating nature, preferring the medieval and Gothic rather than classical. The Romantic movement is in a way a reaction to a big social changes in Europe, brought about by industrial revolution and fear of becoming a cog in a machine and losing your own individuality. Pictures often feature settings in nature somewhere away from urban growth and factories, giving new lace on life to medieval Romantic notions inspired by Middle Ages of Europe or by devotion to elements of that period. Jacques-Louis David is perhaps the most perfect example of French neoclassicism, and it could be argued that Eugène Delacroix is one of the best examples of movement that came after it, the French Romanticism. I encourage you to study both, for they have much to teach you, not just the artists themselves, but the periods as well. I mentioned Easter eggs few times. Easter egg is a term used to describe hidden objects in the picture that are not noticeable at first, but when finally discovered, they bring a small sense of joy to the ones who discovered them. The artist's signature on the barricade is not technically Easter egg because it's pretty easy to find, but you'll probably notice it only after you have scanned and seen the picture a few times, like this guy in the background. The way artists set up liberty leading the people poses a question, are you with us or against us? If you stand there, the figures will run you over. You can join us, of course, but be warned, if you pick up a weapon and stand your ground, you might end up like the dead guards. You can also retreat and regroup. You might have a better chance against us. What are you going to do? Where do you stand? But then again, it's just a well-composed picture teaching us artists' lessons about the craft. 
Nothing is original, steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light and shadows. Select only things to steal from those that speak directly to your soul. If you do this, your work and theft will be authentic. In any case, always remember what Jean-Luc Godard said. It's not where you take things from, it's where you take them to. Adapt what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is uniquely your own. Thank you for watching.